I try not to cover crowdfunding projects anymore for a number of reasons, but when I heard about Confluence the Living Archive, I decided to break my rule. The game is currently raising money on Backerkit, and it features four Asian designers whose work I've talked about previously on the channel, and several other folks who I'd like to get around to discussing someday. Knowing what a stellar lineup of writers the folks at Publishing Goblin had assembled, I had to check out what they were cooking up. Confluence is a multi-genre game with a setting that spans some 700,000 years across many different worlds. The name comes from the fact that magical confluences pull these disparate times and places together, allowing for an incredible blend of peoples and cultures. It's got more art than I've seen in nearly any RPG I've read, and y'all know I'm not an art guy, but it is absolutely beautiful. However, the thing I found most interesting about the Confluence beta materials was their atlas, a 98-page guide to their Motley Coast setting. The Motley Coast is just one of the many promised settings in Confluence, but even this portion is stunningly fleshed out, with maps and regions and various details on local economics that I found really fascinating. But the part that worked the most for me was the way this atlas was constructed. As you can see, the book is working with this standard two-column format that's very popular in tabletop layouts these days, but in the margins of this book are commentary, doodles, and other ephemera from the world of Azuria. See, the atlas is written to be diegetic, or existing within the world of the game itself. And while it's certainly not the first use of a diegetic text, I want to point out some examples of how Confluence really nails its implementation. The opening to the atlas explains that it's a document provided by the Akari Archive Office, an in-world organization which seems to collect information about various regions and collate it into useful handbooks for travelers. The intro explains that many of the contributors to the atlas are local experts who may have included physical documents as well as personal notes to the book. So we already know there are multiple writers of this guide. But the conflicting perspectives of these multiple contributors doesn't become apparent until you start digging through the ephemera. For instance, take a look at this badge, left with a note from a K. Valza saying he doesn't want to wear it. Pretty innocuous. But once you notice the symbol, this anchor, it starts turning up other places. I get on this next page, on a brochure that says machines won't raise tides, and again on a news report about a citizen militia. And then you read another note right under that, stating that Mayor Kem Valza has narrowly won his election, and is now facing opposition from city council members supported by the same Anchorite militia. It's not explicit, but these scraps of news and advertisement suggest there's some sort of political struggle happening. None of that is mentioned in the actual guide text of the book. It's only by reading the extraneous bits, likely included in your guide both by supporters and opponents of the militia, that you find this hidden plotline. Another example of conflicting opinions in the text is found in its passage on the Motley Crew, an alliance of volunteer guard organizations that patrols the region. Composed of members from the City Guard, Boat Brigade, and Nassaros Advocates, the crew ostensibly keeps the peace, determining the customs and laws of the Motley Coast. The core text of the book is pretty high on this crew, describing how the guards limit corruption with open house community feedback forums and educational trips to learn the customs of various parts of the island. They rarely carry weapons unless involved in active operations, preferring to use de-escalation and mediation to solve disputes with civilians. They receive a comprehensive education, studying linguistics, environmental research, and courses on the breadth of cultures and identities present in the coast. As far as police forces go, they seem about as optimal as you can get. And yet, the ephemera of the text asks the readers to take a second glance at the motley crew. Scribbles in the margins bemoan the crew's two-year shift placements, while others criticize their alliance with the Delrin pirates. The relationship between the official government of the Motley Coast and the pirate crews is fascinating, but essentially the state allows the pirates to plunder any vessels that aren't flying Motley Coast flags. This implies that foreign imports probably don't arrive very frequently to the coast, which would cause a higher cost for external goods. I'm willing to bet that there's a good deal of smuggling that happens in order to get around this informal embargo, and that the Motley crew has more than a little bit to do with ensuring supplies get inland without the pirates taking a cut. Certainly, conflict between the groups is brewing, if the pro-pirate slogan scrolled at the bottom of page 68 is any indication. Furthermore, a fictional report named 21ACAB is referenced on the same page where the crew's ineffectual handling of violent crime is discussed. 
While it's more than likely just a developer joke, it does suggest that even within the Akari archive, there are those who would be more than happy to see the crew taken down a peg. As you can see, there's more to the text than meets the eye, largely because of the inclusion of these extraneous details. There is the world as the core text presents it, and then there is the second layer, the various opinions, beliefs, and biases of the people who live in that world. This blurring of the line between and what is and what isn't canon reminds me of a Twitter thread written by designer ZXCU a few years ago, in which Seud criticizes Dungeons & Dragons for presenting its rulebooks as absolute representations of the truth. Many contemporary criticisms of D&D come from its bioessentialist rules, such as orcs getting a mechanical bonus to strength, or lizard folk being necessarily evil. Seud proposes putting those canon explanations of culture in fiction, turning those dicey opinions into in-world bigotry. If a singular, fairly racist organization wrote the Monster Manual, it would make sense why they present all goblins as being shifty little sneaks. The authors themselves are just huge jerks. In this way, the world is allowed to contain multitudes while still showing an aspect of in-universe culture, a peek into a certain understanding of how things are, but not necessarily a correct one. That's the strength of diegetic writing, and I think, in a game where you're trying to portray many dozens of different cultures across 700 millennia, a smart way to get readers to understand that they can have an interpretation of the text beyond the text itself. In a big bad con panel from earlier this year, creative lead Shubham Mehta says as much. Going on, So you have to create these contrasts between what's being said and then sometimes what's being implied. To create a world that feels lived in, there cannot be a singular authority decreeing one absolute truth about the way people and cultures are. We know from living in our real world that something as straightforward as a movie will spawn dozens of different opinions and takes, and those opinions are influenced by things such as culture, class, religion, and education. When designing a tabletop game diegetically, you have to take into account and display to the audience the diversity of influences and thoughts that exist in your world, otherwise it may start to feel static. Writer Viditya Valetti summed up this issue succinctly. Does this feel like, or does this feel weird? Like, are we writing as outsiders or are we writing as insiders? I'm not sure if a project on the scale of Confluence is able to maintain that illusion indefinitely. There are times when the text pretty clearly is setting up a plot hook or explaining a game mechanic in a way that wouldn't make sense in world. When you're making a tabletop game, there's no good way to get around the fact that eventually, you do need to tell the player how to interact with the fictional world using real world tools such as dice and conversation. But I'm glad the Confluence team is trying, because by building a diegetic source book, they're inviting readers to reframe their understanding of what canon can be. I'm not the kind of person who believes you should never engage with the author's intent when examining a piece of media, but I do think a canonical read should not be the only one. And with its use of ephemera, these little fragments that intrude on the pristine depiction of one possible understanding of the world of Ajuria. Confluence broadens the possibility space for the kinds of stories and people the world can, and must, contain. Thank you everybody for watching. I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to see what I'm saying about tabletop games. If you want to help me keep the channel going, you can send me a tip at my ko-fi in the video description. My background picture is liquefied image by Adrian on Unsplash, and my profile picture is by Eater Outsider on Tumblr. If you want to find more of my work, I'm at AA Void on Blue Sky, Monster Factory fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoid.com, where I talk about games and writing. I also turned off my Twitter, so I'm not there anymore. I also do a podcast, Mortified the Friendship Quest, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. We just talked about the Nick Cage Dracula movie, Renfield, which was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks again, as always, for watching. Uh, until the next video, uh, I'll see ya.